Well, uh, thank you, Dick. That's a very kind introduction. Every church has its perks. Uh, kissing a pig, you know, they don't tell you about that when they send you someplace, but I know you're going to put him over the top. I might even come back to see that happen. It's uh, good to be with you today as part of the Vibrant Church Initiative program, um, helping you embrace your future, whatever that is, wherever God may be leading you in this community to embrace where God is calling you. Dick told me as we were visiting in the office this morning, it's his words, and I assume it's true, that Katy is now larger than Philadelphia. Have you heard that? Is that what the Chamber of Commerce says? You don't think so? Is that right? The whole, the larger Katy community, well, that's part of your parish. John Wesley said, the world is my parish. So at least you have lots of opportunities here. You all know how it's growing here. You all know uh, how it's changed. Many of you have seen that change through the years. Where is the place for your church in what is ahead in this community? That's what we want to look at, not only today, but in the weeks and months ahead as you move through this uh, decisive, intentional decision to uh, be a part of the Vibrant Church Initiative and to gather, claim God's future for this community and your church. And I look forward to sharing that to some extent with you. Scripture passage today is from the eighth chapter of Luke's Gospel. Is it your custom to stand for the reading of the Gospel? No, no don't stand then. <clears throat> some places it is. Uh, hear this uh, very powerful story. Now when Jesus returned, the crowd welcomed him, for they were all waiting for him. Just then there came a man named Jairus, leader of the synagogue. He fell at Jesus' feet and begged him to come to his home, for he had an only daughter, about 12 years old, who was dying. As he went, the crowds pressed in on him. Now there was a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for 12 years. And though she had spent all she had on physicians, no one could cure her. She came up behind him and touched the fringe of his clothes. And immediately her hemorrhage stopped. Then Jesus asked, Who touched me? When all denied it, Peter said, Master, the crowds surround you and press in on you. But Jesus said, Someone touched me, for I noticed that power had gone out from me. When the woman saw that she could not remain hidden, she came trembling and falling down before him. She declared in the presence of all the people why she had touched him and how she had been immediately healed. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. While he was still speaking, someone came from the teacher's house to say, Your daughter is dead. Do not trouble the teacher any longer. When Jesus heard this, he replied, Do not fear. Only believe, and she will be saved. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Bless, O oh God, these few moments together that as we consider the witness of the Scripture and how it might impact our lives and our church, we ask your Holy Spirit to be amongst us, to make sure that we hear and to convict us to act and respond through Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, as I said, I, I am glad to be with you today as a part of the Vibrant Church Initiative Program. Your church has voted just last Sunday to embrace this opportunity to intentionally move into the future. And as a part of the program, you are assigned a coach, which happens to be me, to help you work through the processes that are a part of this program. And also you are assigned um, a special Sunday in which you uh, officially affirm not only voting, but in every other way, the participation in this process. And they send a guest preacher, someone like me, in this case it is me, to come and uh, spend this day with you to help us think together about uh, your future. Thinking about all the things that you have been, all of that is part of your past that you want to continue to embrace, maybe some things you want to let go of. 
and how you move forward. I just think this church has such a wonderful opportunity to move forward in this larger community and make a witness for Christ uh, to so many people who are not uh, able to respond to that witness now. There are people there that you can reach, and that's what we want to do. In some ways, uh, Dick, of course, or Mark could have led you more effectively in this particular Sunday, but the program is designed as such that they participate with you. Uh, they respond as you respond, and so it gives them an opportunity to let go of whatever they need to let go of and move forward into the future along with all the members of the congregation. So that's where, why we're here today, and uh, we'll consider the passage that I read. It, it takes great courage to take a new step. We all get comfortable in what we're doing, and to take a new step whatever it might be, especially if you don't know what it's going to be, takes great courage and faith to step out. And as we read the scripture today, the example we have before us is the woman in the crowd, the woman who stepped out to reach out and touch Jesus and had her life made new. He gave her a brand new life that very day. If you think about it, there are lots of reasons why she wouldn't step out. There are lots of reasons why she wouldn't take that step. And if she hadn't taken the step, her life would have remained just like it was. But because she reached out to Jesus in the midst of that crowd, she found her life changed. She could have stayed home because it was not common in that day and time for women to venture into public. And she had, as you know from the scripture, a, a disease something not quite right, a bleeding disorder that had lasted for 12 years. She spent all of her money trying to get help. Nobody could help her. In that particular time, if you had something wrong with you like that, people assumed you'd done something to deserve it, that you must be a sinner of some kind. So in their eyes, we don't think like that now, but in their eyes, they would have understood this is a woman, shouldn't be seen in public, a woman who has a disorder, something wrong with her, she must have done something wrong, so in addition to that, she is a sinner. And in addition to that, it would have never been appropriate for a woman in that culture to touch a man in public in any way. All of those things could have been barriers for her, keeping her at home, keeping her life the same, not taking the courage to step out and touch Jesus. But she overcame all of those barriers and in the process found a new life in the process had her future opened up to her well maybe that's an analogy for all churches but especially for your church in this particular time as you look forward to the vibrant church initiative opportunity to look at barriers whatever they might be and to overcome them Reach out and touch Jesus and find that new life, whatever it is that Jesus may be offering for you. Now, I don't know you. I don't know your church situation. I, I had never been to your church until just a few weeks ago and participated in the weekend experience. But I'm guessing you could find excuses not to reach out. I'm guessing that you could say, well, we don't have enough money. We don't have enough good ideas. We don't have enough people who will work. There could be all kinds of excuses, but you have decided that you will overcome those barriers, reach out and touch Jesus, whatever that may mean for you personally or for your church, and move forward to affirm the future toward which God is calling you. In the story today, we have two females, really, a, a woman, and a, a young girl, both of them are associated with the number 12, which in the Bible tends to mean completeness or wholeness, which I assume in this case means uh, it meant their lot was cast. If they, they had their circumstance in life and they couldn't get out of it, 12 years of bleeding disorder, a girl 12 years old who was dying, this text says, indeed did die before we get to the end. There's, a, there's the rest of the story for that one that I'll get to. But it's interesting to me that neither of the women is named. Jesus is named. The leader of the synagogue is named. One of the disciples is named. 
all males, but the two females in the story are anonymous. No name given to the woman or the little girl. And yet, they were not anonymous to Jesus. Jesus took note, when no one else did, that someone had reached out and touched him. And it made all the difference in their lives. Who has the courage to reach out and touch Jesus, even if you feel anonymous, even if you think there are barriers in the way, even if you think the situation is almost hopeless in your personal life or in the life of your church? Courage and faith to reach out can make all the difference. Now, I wouldn't come to preach in uh, Katy, Texas, especially uh, in this particular church without bringing a high school football story. <clears throat> so uh, I, I brought a story to share with you today. Um, I have five grandchildren, various ages, some in high school, um, and I love to keep up with young people in the activities that they're involved in, and I love to attend their special events, whether it's music or choir or drama or sports, whatever it might be in my own grandchildren's lives, and I used to enjoy that as a pastor of a church and other young people that I might know. I read a story in the Houston Chronicle. Some of you may have seen it. It, it was a, a, maybe a year, a year and a half ago. It was about a young man who attended high school at South Houston High School on the other side of town. His name was Mario Herrera. And Mario um, was born with a condition that could have been a limiting circumstance for his life. His upper body was normal size and normal strength, but his legs never developed to their full capacity. His legs made him about a foot shorter than he would have otherwise have been. Instead of being five, six, or five, eight, he was only four foot six or four foot eight. Uh, and yet when he entered high school, he went to talk to his football coach and said he wanted to play high school football. Now, all of this was in the Houston Chronicle, a story that I took great uh, joy in reading. His football coach did a wise thing. He didn't say to him, well, you can't play. You just don't have the physical attributes that are needed. And he didn't say to him, well, you can be the mascot. You can do something like that. Rather, he said to him, if you work hard, if you develop whatever abilities you have to the fullest potential, you can be a part of this team. And so he began doing that. He started lifting weights. He made his arms stronger. He made his legs stronger, even though they were not very long. He made them stronger. He was able to play on the freshman team, played on the junior varsity team. And in his senior year in high school, he was on the varsity football team. They were playing Manville High School. Now, I live down between Pearland and Manville in Brazoria County. Some of you know Manville is a, a great football power. And in the game that South Houston played against Manville High School, uh, Mario was able to make a solo tackle on one of those great running backs from Manville High School, and he heard his name called over the loudspeaker. And he said it was like going from being anonymous <laughs> to being affirmed by everyone in that, station, in that stadium because he overcame the barriers that were given in his life and reached out and it made a difference. You know, as fate would have it, I have a grandson that plays uh, uh, sports at Pearland High School. I hope that's not a dirty word here. I think the, we've met on the field a few times. Um, but he played junior varsity basketball and I went to see one of his games and as the basketball team from South Houston, that's who they were playing, was walking in to the gym, I saw a young man who apparently was the manager of the basketball team that I just knew had to be Mario that was described in the Chronicle article. And uh, sure enough, it was. And though he had played football and he managed the basketball team, uh, he was able to share that day, as I was able to meet him, that what he wants to do with his life is to become a motivational speaker. Now, I'm telling you, he's already inspired me. 
all that he's overcome in life and to look forward and to embrace the future, uh, letting go of the past that has held him back, embracing whatever future is his, overcoming everything necessary in order to move forward into a future. He's a great example. I take great uh, pleasure in noticing young people and old people and any age person who will overcome barriers and move forward to where uh, life could be so much more richer. There's a uh, seminary professor at Yale Divinity School whose name is William Mule. And every year in the first year seminary class when he gathers those would-be preachers in uh, his uh, class for their first class session, he says to them this, always remember that most people you will see in the pews on Sunday morning almost decided not to come that day. Now is that sometimes true of you? You know, you had a hard week, you don't feel real good, got a guest preacher like today, uh, someone said something, kind of put you off a little bit, you had lots of chores you could have done. I know how many things are scheduled for children on Sunday mornings these days outside of the church. There's always something else to do. And most people you see in the pews on Sunday morning almost decided not to come. But you did come. But if that is true of you, if it's true of you who've made a commitment, this is your church, how much more true is it of someone who might be a guest in your worship experience on Sunday morning. Think of all the barriers they had to overcome to walk in those doors for the first time, strange people, not that you're strange, but people <laughs> that they don't know, people that not a part of their sphere of friendship, but they walk in the door, overcoming whatever hesitation they might have had, however many other things they could have done, they almost decided not to come, but for some reason, Something down deep inside encouraged them to reach out to this church, to Jesus, and to overcome whatever it was holding them back and come to church here. And all I want to ask you to do is to be like Jesus. That's always a good thing to do. But in this particular case, to notice. To notice that one in the crowd who is reaching out so that you might respond as Jesus responded. There are two words in the gospel reading today that I think are powerful for our consideration. Uh, for the woman in the crowd, when she had touched Jesus and found her life changed, maybe you noticed what he said to her. Now he could have said, I made you well. He could have said, I healed you. He could have said, a miracle has happened here. But what he said to her was, your faith has made you well. That is her act of reaching out, her having the courage to make her way through that crowd and reach out and touch Jesus. That was what made her well. Jesus certainly was a participant in that process and it was indeed his power. Yet he affirmed her that she had taken the initiative to do what was necessary to find a new life. And the other word in the text that we read today is about the, the little girl. You know, remember, uh, Jesus said it's, it's an interesting text because Jesus has just returned. And by the way, he had just returned, if you remember the scripture, in the seventh chapter of Luke's gospel, from the place of the Gerasenes. Do you remember that story? Across the Sea of Galilee where the man lived in the graveyard and had uh, unclean spirits and yelled all the time and didn't wear any clothes and no one had anything to do with him. And Jesus cast out the unclean spirits into the pigs and they ran off into the water and drowned. That's what Jesus said. It says in the beginning of the text, now he had returned. That's where he returned from, that experience. And as soon as he sets foot back in Galilee, the leader of the synagogue comes up to him and says, my daughter's dying, I need some help. So wedged in between the garrison demoniac, as we call him, and the little girl dying at home is this story of the woman. And Jesus took the time in the midst of all of that to notice and to respond. But according to the scripture, 
In the meantime, a little girl died. We're all talking, are talking about Jesus here. And if we'd read the rest of the story, we would know that Jesus raised her back to new life. New life for the woman, new life for the little girl, new life for everyone who reaches out to touch Jesus. And the word that Jesus shares with those who've gathered around thinking all hope is lost is do not be afraid. So to the woman, he said, your faith has made you well. Take courage, move forward into the future. And to the family and friends of the little girl, he said, do not be afraid. Whenever you launch into something new, vibrant church initiative, some of you are just becoming familiar with that, don't know for sure what it might hold, it's simply an intentional way for you to embrace your future. And maybe two of the words you need to hear are, your faith will lead you forward, and do not be afraid. Trust that God is in the process. One of my uh, favorite mentors is uh, Peter Story, and uh, he was a pastor in South Africa, he's still living, but uh, he uh, has inspired me in many ways. And I want to tell you that uh, story about him in just a moment, but I, I, I want to preface it by saying, when I was a pastor, I, I've been retired for almost uh, four years now, but I was a pastor for over 40 years, and this probably happens to Dick and Mark and other pastors that you may know, maybe all across everywhere, but I used to wake up in the middle of the night. I couldn't sleep, and somebody would be on my mind, somebody in my congregation. And I can't explain it. I just attribute it to God. And I would wake up, and I would just say a prayer for that person, try to go back to sleep. But every now and then, in the middle of the night, I would wake up, and it wasn't like it was a dream, but I would wake up, and there would be something that came to me, and I attribute that to God, that I thought God wanted me to share in a sermon. Sometimes I'd get up and scramble around, try to find a pencil and write it down. Sometimes I'd just make a point that I'm going to remember this. And then I would find a way that that could be a part of a sermon on a Sunday morning. Well, I don't have a congregation anymore, so you're it. <laughs> Because that happened to me recently again. It's, it hadn't happened that I can remember since I retired not preaching regularly every now and then. But this is what came to me, Dick, in the middle of the night. And that is, we receive new members into the church. They walk the aisle, I assume, here. And we ask them those questions. Will you be loyal to the church, supportive of prayers, presence, gifts, service, and witness? Uh, will you, do you love Jesus? Do you repent of, repent of your sins? And those kinds of questions. And my thought was, what if, that's a good thing to ask, what if, what if we as clergy gave you as a congregation an opportunity to ask one question of that new member of your church? And we'd have to trust you because, you know, you could ask something embarrassing. <laughs> You could ask something that we'd say, oh, I wish he hadn't said that. <laughs> we'd have to trust you. We'd have to let go of some control and say, you know, what question would you ask? And here's what I hope you would ask. Here's what I hope you would ask of a new member of your church. Not will you tithe, you might be tempted to ask that one. Not would you teach the junior high Sunday school class. Not will you serve on this committee or that. I hope you would ask this question. Will you love Jesus? That ought to be enough. Will you love Jesus in your daily walk? Maybe there's a corollary to that. The corollary might be, will you love all the people that Jesus loved? All of those who are outside the realm of grace for whatever reason, will you love them into a relationship to Jesus and into your church. Now, in reference to Peter's story, a pastor in South Africa, he did a powerful thing. Uh, when they were struggling with the apartheid situation uh, in South Africa, he was a friend of Desmond Tutu and Nelson Mandela. And 
when they were in the midst of all the violence there, he took his stole off in his church one Sunday and he laid it on the altar. And he said, uh, I won't put my stole back on again until we work this out, until we get right what is wrong in our land. And I just think what a powerful witness that must have been all through the years, <laughs> stole laying on the altar and making a, a silent witness for all that could be that wasn't yet there. Duke Divinity School bought, brought uh, Peter Story to the school there to uh, be a mentor for young, young clergy, and he spoke at our annual conference a few years ago, and I had him speak at St. Paul's Church, <clears throat> and I never will forget what he said in that sermon when he preached. He said, uh, you know, in South Africa, we're more influenced by the Anglican tradition. We're a little more formal. Um, we, you have a saying in America where you say, will you invite Jesus into your heart? He said, we don't, we don't really think or speak like that. We may say, we'll follow Jesus in discipleship, uh, that we'll follow Jesus along the road, that we'll make a commitment to Jesus, but we don't really say, accept Jesus into your heart. It's a little foreign for Anglican traditions. But he said, you know, I like that. There's something powerful about it. And then he said, do you know what Jesus will say if you invite him into your heart? He will say, can I bring my friends? Can I bring my friends into your heart? The derelict in the graveyard, the woman that's anonymous that nobody notices in the crowd, the little girl that's suffering from a disease, the person left by the side of the road that someone beat up and left all alone, and all those other characters that we read of in the Bible, but not just the characters in the Bible, but those in your community, in the highways and byways where you are, will you notice, will you accept Jesus into your heart, and will you let him bring his friends? And in that way, reach out to this community. And the, the, the tragedy is not that you might miss a new church member. <laughs> it's that someone's life might not be made whole by the ministry of this church. So that's all I want to ask you to do in the process of moving into the Vibrant Church Initiative to have faith, to overcome barriers, to not be afraid, to invite Jesus into your heart, and to receive his friends, all of those whose lives might be changed, and see your church in the process and your own life transformed. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.